Welcome to Dissecting Philosophy with Dr. MacDonald. In this episode, I'll be reading and discussing the section of the land of culture in Nietzsche's The Spoke Zarathustra, and I'll also have a wee discussion of the episode from South Park, banned in China, to accompany the section. So let's get started. Of the land of culture. I flew too far into the future. A horror assailed me, and when I looked around, behold, time was my only contemporary. Then I flew back, homeward, and faster and faster I flew, and so I came to you, you men of the present, and to the land of culture. The first time I brought with me an eye to see you, and healthy desires, truly I came to you with longing in my heart. But how did I fare? Although I was so afraid, I had to laugh. My eye had never seen anything so motley spotted. I laughed and laughed, while my foot still trembled and my heart as well. Here must be the home of all the paint pots, I said. Painted with fifty blotches on face and limbs, thus you sat there to my astonishment, you men of the present, and with fifty mirrors around you flattering and repeating your opalescence. Truly, You could wear no better mask than your own faces, you men of the present. Who could recognize you? Written over the signs of the past, and these signs overdaubed with new signs, thus you have hidden yourselves well from all interpreters of signs. And if one tests your virility, one only finds sterility. You seem to be baked from colors and scraps of paper glued together. All ages and all people gaze motley out of your veils. All customs and all beliefs speak motley out of your gestures. He who tore away from you your veils and wraps in paint and gestures would have just enough left over to frighten the birds. Truly, I myself am the frightened bird who once saw you naked and without paint, and I flew away when the skeleton made advances to me. I would rather be a day laborer in the underworld and among the shades of the bygone. Even the inhabitants of the underworld are fatter and fuller than you. Yeah, this, yes, this is bitterness to my stomach, that I can endure you neither naked nor clothed, you man of the present. And the unfamiliar things of the future, and whatever frightened birds, stray birds, are truly more familiar and more genial than your reality. For thus you speak, we are complete realists, and without belief or superstition, thus you thump your chests. Alas, even without having chests! But how should you be able to believe, you motley spotted men? You who are all paintings of all that has ever been believed, You are walking refutations of belief itself, and the fracture of all thought, unworthy of belief. This is what I call you, you realists. All ages babble in confusion in your spirits, and the dreaming and babbling of all ages was more real than your waking. You are unfruitful, therefore you lack belief. But he who has had to create always had his prophetic dreams and star auguries. And he believed in belief. You are half-open doors at which grave diggers wait. And this is your reality. Everything is worthy of perishing. Ah, how you stand there, you unfruitful man. How lean-ribbed. And indeed, many of you have noticed that. And they have said, Perhaps a god has secretly taken something from me there as I slept. Truly sufficient to form a little woman for himself, amazing is the poverty of my ribs. This is how many a present-day man has spoken. Yes, you are laughable to me, you men of the present, and especially when you are amazed at yourselves. And woe to me if I could not laugh at your amazement and had to drink down all that is repulsive in your bowels. 
However, I will make light of you, since I have heavy things to carry, and what do I care if beetles and dragonflies sit themselves on my bundle? Truly, it shall not become heavier on that account, and the great weariness shall not come to me from you, you men of the present. Alas, whither shall I climb now with my longing? I look out from every mountain for fatherlands and motherlands, but nowhere have I found a home. I am unsettled in every city, and I depart from every gate. The men of the present to whom my heart once drove me are strange to me in a mockery, and I have been driven from fatherlands and motherlands. So now I love only my children's land, the undiscovered land and the furthest sea. I bid myself seek it and seek it. I will make amends to my children for being the child of my fathers, and to all the future for this present. Thus spoke Zarathustra. So immediately kicking off this section, we have Zarathustra going forward in his own little time machine that he seems to have through his own ability of being able to fly and horror immediately comes over him of what the future state is going to be like. And so having that vision of a horrific future, which is of course completely left open to what horror that is exactly he then wants to travel back into his present period and therefore correct whatever horrific future is going to be there but when he does go into the present he's completely dissatisfied with everything that he sees in the present and so in a way we have that nice sort of Marty McFly from Back to the Future 2 sort of situation of Marty having gone into the future and then through his actions created a horrible situation for himself that has to go back and fix it. So we have this nice sort of relation back into here of Zarathustra needing to fix the situation so ultimately the whole period in which he's living in can be better as well as the future is going to be much better as well but what we have then is a really deep point and to say well in order for any problem to get resolved we have to deal with it in the here and now you can't let it just linger on and linger on in any given way because what's a possibility is that it's just going to manifest itself in like a snowball effect and it'll just get bigger and bigger and eventually it will just become monstrous. And wouldn't you rather go back and fix out the problem when it wasn't monstrous? And so when he goes back then into the present, he's completely disgusted really with everybody that he sees there. And why is that the case? Because everybody doesn't have a sense of their own values, own opinions or beliefs for themselves. They're really quite hollow, as he says. And what ultimately do they do as a population is just wrap themselves in the values, ideas, opinions, and beliefs from the past. And that's the problem, of course, is all given in the past. And therefore, you just say, well, this given idea was a great idea. And that's the point that Nietzsche is trying to make. Yes, it was perhaps a great idea in the past, but it's not going to work quite the same way in the here and now in the present. We have to make it either work differently or completely just disregard the idea if it has absolutely no relation into how to fix the current problem. You can't just uphold past ideas and past beliefs. And then it goes into just the whole philosophical idea about it as well of people then needing to shape and form their own opinions beliefs and ideas because as he says once you sort of pull all this off people like they're somehow wrapped in a big mummy like bandages of past values and opinions you would just see them stark naked and it would be frightening because they've got nothing there they're ultimately just hollow shells of people. And we get that fantastic line, you who are paintings of all that has ever been believed. And 
You are walking refutations of belief itself and the fracture of all thought, unworthy of belief. That is what I call you, you realists. And so we have really an incredible argument for the necessity of belief itself. And even he says here, at least people who are superstitious and religious, even though the word religion doesn't actually pop up in any given way, he says at least they have a sense of conviction and actual belief and ideas. Whilst, as he says here in the present age, we're stuck with a sense of people who are wrapping themselves in past ideas, past opinions, and having all that lack of belief and that fantastic image again we have of at least a person who has belief always had prophetic dreams and star auguries and he always believed in belief so even like saying the prophetic sense of it as well here he's saying these people at least had a conviction and sense of it even if it's in the mystical sense here as well that he's touching upon so superstition and mysticism and that also relation into religion as well all having that sense of belief coming out of it whilst the present age he says doesn't and because of all that we're left in this just lack of values whatsoever to be upheld and so he says the present age is almost like a graveyard because there's no actual ideas that are coming forth in any given way and all that we have is just this churning back up of the previous ideas and that's that fantastic image there of everything is worthy of perishing there's nothing to hold on to or grasp onto anymore because nothing is valued anymore and so we ultimately end up in quite a sort of nihilistic outlook really for the present age is saying where we have a lack of meaning and a lack of belief in anything whatsoever and so really here you could say well Nietzsche is arguing completely against the sense of nihilism because we have to have that sense of belief value purpose conviction in exactly what ideas are coming forth then what ideas should they be new things that precisely answer problems of the present and not simply just a repetition of things in the past which is an amazing thing as well as a section because Nietzsche sometimes charged himself with being a nihilist in the fact that people would argue that Nietzsche's philosophy is one that argues that life is meaningless and that doesn't have any core concepts and so forth about it but here it's quite precisely the opposite in fact a way it's arguing for everything that traditionally within Nietzsche or at least the stereotype anyway would be against and it's arguing for superstition mysticism and religion all because of the ways in which it's upholding belief but also we should take that with a pinch of salt as well because he's saying well what we want ultimately is that level of belief and conviction that they have but to push this forward more so in order to reach a point in the future where we can take all this sense of it and then mold it into a positive future for ourselves one that's of course not going to focus on the same things that mysticism superstition and religion does because we're going to turn it the opposite way around and focus precisely on all the things that people have traditionally argued against the necessity and importance of the body the importance of the world the importance of our desiring processes within the body and so on all these different things that people traditionally undervalue and push under the carpet in order to argue for grand metaphysical principles ethical models and so on and so really it's interesting just the very idea of Nietzsche himself saying the present age that he was in has a very problem of belief itself and how can we have meaning ultimately how to arrive back at a meaningful purposeful existence for ourselves and that's where you have that whole 
sense of displacement at the end of the section as well where he says you know i feel displaced because i've ultimately been very invigorated by my own country that i'm in but now i've tried to look and basically it's no longer the country i once knew it to be and what i am driven for is this sense of a children's land as he says so this whole idea of the children goes back into that three metamorphoses idea that set up way back in part one where you have of course the camel who's having the burdens of society and then the lion who then fights all the opinions and burdens and then you have the children and so the children are the point in which it's once all that battling with burdens and the challenge to change ideas taking place then creativity can take place itself and it's really Nietzsche saying here that when we want to challenge ideas what are we faced with we're faced with a bunch of people all upholding ideas themselves they're all being camel like in a sense they're all being weighed down by the past and past ideas and values and so I want to go and challenge all that I want to be lion like ultimately but what happens when you be lion like you become displaced because you no longer fit in within the norms that is given to you within society and so that's that line I've been driven from my homeland and fatherland but then what can you do is the lion that's not the creative person so Zarathustra himself is not going to be arguing for precisely the position of new concepts and ideas he's going to be opening the door but in such a way to allow for that creative process to take place by doing battle with all those past values and ideas and it's only the children the ones after him that are going to be able to reach those new ideas and values for everyone and what happens of course if you only stick to the past values past ideas once you try to open the door to anything new you don't have anything new you're just presented with that whole graveyard for creativity because there is nothing new there you've just got hollow ideas of the past and why are they hollow of course or skeleton like as Nietzsche says is because it doesn't have the same vigor and relation back into the time period like it did whenever it was created because that's the thing that gave it all the flesh and meat and bone in the first place was its time period take that away you're just ultimately left with a skeleton walking about or there's a really good idea in Derrida in which he says there's a whole idea of ghosts for our past values and ideas in the same sense of skeletons here in which everybody has this whole bringing the ghosts back of the past and so an idea for Derrida would be the ghosts of Marxism and Karl Marx's philosophy that was continually popped back again but of course the whole point of the Nietzsche is to then for be a ghostbuster in a way because you want to say well that's okay for ideas of the past but let's say for Marx how could we make that work better in contemporary society because you're going to have to make it work completely differently because Marx's criticisms are very much based upon the industrial period in which he's writing and therefore just to repeat exactly what he said and uphold his values is not going to make it work great in contemporary society you're going to have to make it work you're going to have to think up a new idea you're going to have to go through all that whole challenge again become lion like do fighting with all the people who have upheld certain idea of Marx and so forth in the past to therefore allow the floodgates for a whole new idea to therefore emerge in the future and also rounding off the discussion for this section we have that fantastic line truly you could wear no better masks than your own faces you men of the present who could recognize you it's such a fantastic idea that whole image of just wearing a mask because 
what are ultimately people doing is just being this whole other person. They're not even being themselves anymore. Because who are you? That is what Nietzsche's point is. Who are you? You don't want to be that mask. You don't want to ultimately therefore put on a prop. You don't want to therefore be a spokesperson for somebody else. You want to be a spokesperson for you. And your beliefs and your ideas don't be like a mask. But a fun example I thought to discuss for this section would be a recent South Park episode called Banned in China that was recently on from October 2nd, 2019 from the recent 23rd season of South Park. And of course the title itself is banned in the sense of rock band in China but also then has the whole sense of also going to be banned in China which it subsequently was for what it said in the episode but it was making a really interesting point that companies don't really have any sense of actual belief or value or meaning or even a sense of morals as well in trying to achieve money and what are they trying to achieve money from is to always appeal to the Chinese market and then manipulating changing musical lyrics and changing screenplays for films and so forth all to make sure it would adhere to the whole Chinese government's expectation and what's of course interesting is the sense of while well, you have a whole American companies not really even caring about American values. What is American values when it comes down to actually acquiring money? And that's a really quite deep point that it's trying to make of, well, there is no values in the first place. There's no actual belief that they have in the country, which is hitting hard against the whole idea of Trump, of course, arguing hard for American values, for American companies, and the benefit of American jobs for American people, and all that side of argument. Well, South Park makes the really good sort of counter argument to all that. We'll say, well, American companies don't really care about America itself. All what they care about is money and the accumulation of money. And when it comes down to the absolute bare bones of things, there is no belief there. The belief is in the power of the almighty dollar, one might say. And what's so great as well, it fits so nicely into the whole section for Nietzsche as well. Shouldn't you have belief in American values? Shouldn't you have belief and a sense of morality here? Surely everything just can't be about money. Surely there's workers' rights, for instance. So ultimately you could say, well, Nietzsche's philosophy here is one of the future, not in the sense of eventually people in the future will understand Nietzsche's philosophy and therefore everything will be all hunky-dory, but rather the sense of, well, Nietzsche's philosophy is focused on a resolving problems in the present. And therefore, if we resolve problems in the present, ultimately, we can reach a much better future for ourselves, one that's not going to be horrifying, and that we can look upon happily and not in complete fear. Because it's also saying as well here, if only you could have seen how they would have used it in the future, would you have still done and said what you did? And this could be, of course, pointed towards philosophy's emphasis upon metaphysics, upon the soul over the body, and so on. And then to have that really critical question against it. If only you could have seen what you ultimately have created for humanity's future, would you still have did it? Many thanks for listening to the episode. Feel free to check me out on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash dissecting philosophy. Feel free to also drop me a wee email at my address dissectingphilosophy at gmail.com and I can also be found on Twitter at I am a rubber man. 
Many thanks for listening and I hope you'll join me next time. Thank you.